What attracts our attention more than anything else in the garden? Well, it would have to be color. We'll take a look at that important principle of garden design coming up next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home, where you'll see lots of practical ideas and beautiful landscapes, all designed to inspire you to push the boundaries of your home out into the garden and expand your living space. Now today's show is all about color and how we can bring more of it into our gardens. I have to say that when I walk into a garden, color is one of the first things I notice. That's because it helps to set the mood. Let's look at a quick example. A garden like this makes the visitor feel rested and cool. That's because a monochromatic color palette was used. Refreshing greens and crisp whites. Now compare this color palette to a garden on the opposite end of the spectrum. Bright, bold colors with lots of contrast make this garden feel alive and visitors walk away energized. We'll take a closer look at how colors affect our moods coming up with a visit to one of England's grandest gardens, Chatsworth. When you see blooms like these, you have to wonder about the science that goes into making an ordinary flower something exceptional and more appealing to gardeners. Well, it's all in the hybridization. And we'll get to that a little later in the show when we catch up with a plant breeder to find out how new varieties of daylilies are developed for our gardens. We'll also, throughout the entire show, see how to use color more effectively. Now, you may be thinking, a garden show is a great idea, lots of beautiful pictures, but I live in an apartment, so how can any of this apply to me? Well, actually, I'm a great advocate of container gardening, and many of these principles will apply to a single container. So where do you learn about using color in the garden? Well, here's a garden that's not lacking for room to grow lots of color, and it's a wonderful example by any standard. This is Chatsworth in England, home to the 11th Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. Chatsworth is a lot of things to a lot of different people. I mean, primarily, it is a great building, uh, a family home. It's been the same family's home for 450 years. A lot of people come here to see a wonderful art collection but probably as many are coming to see the garden because the house has got this landscape that has evolved around it and grown and developed and been enhanced by so many different generations of the family. As you can see, this garden is almost like a playground for gardeners of every age. And everywhere you look, there's a lesson in good garden design. If you take the time to look at a well-designed garden closely, you soon discover that all of the elements of design are working in harmony. Elements of design such as line, form, texture, and of course color. Now I'd have to say that color is the element that gets me the most excited. You see, you can do astonishing things with color. You can create a sense of depth, or you can make a garden actually feel smaller by the colors you choose. Let me give you an example. If you want to make an area look much larger or expansive, you'll want to use a color that matches the sky, a cool color like blue. If you want to make a garden feel smaller or create a sense of shortened distance, use a bright color like red. Color can also affect our mood. You see those cool colors, the blues, lavenders, and grays can actually make us feel cool, restful. Whereas the hot colors can energize us, make us feel warmer. Take for instance, this herbaceous border. It is indeed a hot border. The color scheme is very warm. It starts with bright reds and works its way through orange, golden yellows to bright yellow. Even some of the plant names evoke a hot place. For instance, this crocosmia is called Lucifer. Other plants that help achieve this effect in the borders are bronze fennel, black-eyed Susans, daylilies, dahlias, and of course, that North American wildflower, goldenrod. Now for me personally, I tend to gravitate toward a cooler color palette. Maybe it is because it makes me feel more restful, relaxed. 
And quite frankly, I must have a thing for the color blue. Just look at some of the plant combinations in this cool border. Agapanthus contrasted with baby's breath, the spiny sea holly next to the blooms of monk's hood. Then there's veronica, petunias, lavender, all set off by drifts of white that make the whole color scheme sparkle. You know, one of the most enjoyable and satisfying exercises I went through was to create a monochromatic color scheme in my fountain garden. There I focused on all whites and grays. Now, I was so rigid with my thinking about this. Everything had to either be gray or white. And this went on for two or three years, and although it glistened in the moonlight, it was actually a magical composition, I began to get bored with it, and over time, I began to let other colors drift in. Some soft pastels in the way of pinks and lavender. As you can see, this garden isn't dominated by flowers. Rather, it's the interplay of this silvery gray and glaucous foliage that creates the magic in this space. You know, no matter what size garden you create, whether it's one on this scale or even in a container, texture and color play a very important role. The main thing to remember is just choose colors that make you happy. You see, color is one of the 12 principles of design that I use when I create a garden home. Now, what I mean by a garden home is a home where the garden itself is an extension of the house, where the living space is pushed right to the boundaries of the property, where the inside of the home is folded outdoors, where you have a series of garden rooms, if you will. Now, here's a way to look at it. Think of using color outside the same way as you do inside, but rather than using paint and fabric to create color combinations, as you do inside your home, use flowers and foliage as the paint. In my garden home, I have a series of garden rooms that make a circuit around the house. My entire property is really quite small. It's only 100 by 150 feet. The house sits roughly in the middle with the garage and back. Surrounding my house are nine garden rooms, and that's what's great about this framework, because you see these rooms offer me an option to create different color combinations during different times of the year. For instance, from spring until fall, my vegetable garden is full of more than good food to eat. I go out of my way to incorporate edible flowers, such as pansies, violas, and nasturtiums, and flowers for cutting, like these gladiolas. The vegetables themselves add their own special brand of color in the way of peppers, tomatoes, Swiss chard, and kale. In the rondelle, or round garden, I enjoy planting pink impression tulips, and lots of them, which will bloom along with my crabapple trees in the spring. You see, the pink buds of the crabapple flower is picked up in the tulips below. If you take a peek in my fountain garden, you'll see a monochromatic study of color using white, gray, and green. I lean heavily on white flowering old-fashioned roses, lamb's ear, and artemisia. Now, in the front of my house, I have a large English-inspired border. Throughout the year, the colors in these borders range as roses bloom, lilies open, and waves of salvia carry color into the fall. The garden room along the side of my house is where I enjoy the challenge of planting in the shade. This garden is dominated by an ancient oak that provides a protective canopy during the hottest days of summer. Here I grow hostas, Solomon seal, columbine, bleeding hearts, and waves of impatience. So as you can see, the color choices you make for your garden rooms can be just as exciting and just as satisfying as those that you use in the inside of your home. And there's no better way to bring color into your life than through annuals. Let me introduce you to some of the annuals I enjoy using. I'm always looking for plants that help me solve problems in the garden. For instance, shade. There's a limited number of plants you can grow there, particularly if you're wanting lots of bloom. But there's one family of plants that always delivers, and that's the impatience. There's such a wide range of them. Starting with the New Guineas, you can find a myriad of color, both in terms of bloom and foliage. But the most impressive thing to me about a New Guinea impatient is if you compare a standard impatient bloom to the size of a New Guinea, just look at the difference. New Guineas are almost three to four times larger. There are impatience for everyone, whether you like the blooms large or small. 
I recently tried a miniature variety called Firefly that's done very well in my garden. When growing in patients, there's some things you may want to know. When it comes to light, these plants require partial shade. That's ideal. You see, too much sun will cause the leaves to shrink or even burn. Now, when it comes to water, you want to keep them consistently moist. Don't let them dry out completely. When plants dry out, it's often difficult for them to completely recover. If you want to promote lots of blooms like these throughout the summer, it's important to feed them regularly, about every three weeks, with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer that's high in phosphorus. That's the middle number. Now, some of the design techniques that I use with impatients is to use a lot of the same color in one area, whether it's sweeps of color in a bed or in a large low bowl like this. Now, if you'd like to get the color up to eye level, try growing impatients in hanging baskets like these. The summer garden just wouldn't be complete without petunias. They're an old-fashioned, sweet-smelling favorite that just continues to get better and better. And there's so many applications for them in the garden. Just look at these beautiful cascading petunias hanging along this fence. One of my favorite ways to use petunias is to mass containers of them together like this, where you create mounds of color. Petunias are such great companion plants for other flowering annuals, such as ageratum and verbena. Now, if you're into creating drifts of color in your flower beds, look no further than petunias. In my garden, I've had great success with the storm series of petunias. The blooms seem to recover quickly after a rain. I particularly like the combination of the dark blue and light blue together. They're great companions to classic perennials like artemisia and daylilies. Now, after seeing all the color petunias can bring to your garden, you're still not convinced to plant them. Remember what I said earlier, they have a marvelous aroma and they can fill your garden with a sweet perfume. The other great thing about these modern petunias over the old fashioned ones is that they're self-cleaning, like the oven, meaning they'll drop their spent blossoms with ease. When Americans think about adding a splash of color to their garden, they frequently reach for this old-fashioned favorite, the geranium. It consistently ranks among the top 10 annuals we choose for our summer gardens. They're a classic for adorning porches, containers, window boxes, or even using in the flower garden. And while the traditional red has been the color of choice, in recent years, there's been a lot of work to improve not only the selection and color of bloom, but foliage as well. They've taken that band or zone of color on the leaf and expanded it in lots of different ways. Just look at the color of this leaf and bloom. What will the plant breeders think of next? Between the development of seed for new annual varieties and the cell packs full of colorful plants you pick up at the garden center, there lies a very important step. Patrick Steffen, the production manager here at Kalahara Nurseries in Morgan Hill, California, shows us how they produce millions of seedlings each year. How does this all start? Basically, we start with the seed, we fill the plug trays, we'll take this and we'll smooth it like so. Once the excess is cleaned off, we'll feed it in here. This is a dibbler. What this does is it dibbles the soil. There's a photo eye in here that tells it when the tray is in position. Once it's been sown, it is covered in a medium grade vermiculite. Right. Very lightly. Very lightly. And here it comes through. By the way, how many plants are we going to get in this? In this particular plug tray, there's 512 plants. Amazing. And as we move across here, the eye will activate, and there's the rain. There's the rain. All together, we probably do about 30 to 40 million seedlings a year. So once they're watered in, where do they go from here, Patrick? They go to the germination chamber, Alan. So inside here, this is just like being underground. That's correct. It's maintained at 68 degrees constant with 100% humidity. 
We hold approximately 35 racks in here, which equals to about 1,000 flats at a time. This is called our plug range, and what we do here is once they come out of the germination chamber, we bring them in here where we will hold them anywhere from two, three weeks to a couple months, depending on the finish time. Once they reach a certain size and they have a certain number of roots on them, then we will take them over to the transplant area. Why do you get such a high germination rate? Because we buy high quality seed, we look for the best seed available to make sure our customers are happy, make sure we get the numbers that we're anticipating out of a plug tray. So that's the reason almost every one of these holes is filled with a plant? That's correct. So Patrick, what's going on in here? Looks like we're following these impatients around. You're right, what we're doing now is we're transplanting impatients. We have a soil filling machine down there that fills the flats. They're conveyor down to the transplanter. It transplants about 3,500 flats in an eight hour period. These two people here, what they're doing is they're making sure that all the plants are in their proper place. It's tagged, watered, and loaded onto the cart. Here is our finishing area. Basically after they're transplanted, they're put into a greenhouse for about two or three weeks in order to get them to root and to fill out the pot a little bit. Once they've reached a certain size, we'll bring them out here to acclimate them, to get them in the color and to harden them off and then we'll ship them to the retailers. And these are just getting ready to go out? These are basically ready to go out right now. Well, as the production manager here, you must get great satisfaction from growing such magnificent plants. Extreme satisfaction. Uh, it's a pleasure that you're bringing something into the public's eye that makes them smile, makes them happy, uh, brightens up their daily lives. The popularity of gardening has really grown over the last five or ten years. I think it's America's number one hobby right now. Yes, uh, it is. It's all in the power of the flower. We've all noticed the simple beauty of wildflowers along roadsides or in meadows. Many of us, including myself, have attempted to grow these in our gardens. However, some plant enthusiasts look at flowers with a different eye. Hybridizers of flowers look at plants for ways to try to improve them by making them taller, larger, sturdier, showier, or even change their color. Kevin Vaughn is a plant geneticist who moved from Massachusetts to Mississippi for his profession, as well as to develop a passion for creating new flowers for our gardens. Daylilies seem to be one of your favorite plants to hybridize. It's just a very simple process of transferring the pollen to the stigma, like that. The pollen is the fluffy part and it lays on the stigmatic lip. And if you're lucky, your cross is successful you get a little pod like this green structure right here. And in about six to eight weeks, that pod will ripen. You'll find, ooh, you hope a, a great number of seeds, usually not so many. Uh, right. 15, 20 is probably a, a very good number. Uh, you've tagged it with who, you, which pollen you put on that particular plant. Right, so the parents are listed. Right, <laughs> so you, as a good hybridizer, you wanna make sure you know who your parents are so that if you, if you have to make a really good cross you can come back next year and do the same cross again. During these times of constant change hybridizers like Kevin are taking the best traits of some of our most beloved flowers and making them even better for the next generation of gardeners. What does a hybridizer look for in a flower? Well as a hybridizer I, I never look at a flower as a, as a finished product. I look at it as the next step. Like when this thing bloomed here, uh, you know, very nice edge, but I wish it were a little wider. So I'm now gonna take this flower, cross it to something with a little more petal width, maybe a hair more ruffling to enhance that fringy edge on there. So I'm always thinking about the next step. Right. We're never happy. My friends call it gilding the lily, and I think it's a very appropriate phrase, so. 10 years ago, round and ruffled was everything. If you had a round, perfectly round flower, uh, and was ruffled, that was it. Right now, gaudy sells. <laughs> and if you can make something that's really bright or bold, a very contrasted eye, a, a black eye on a yellow, a black eye on a white, something with rims of different colors, that kind of thing is what the daily connoisseur is buying these days. <laughs> Color 
is a significant part of my garden in every season, but especially in summer. When temperatures begin to rise, my color preferences change. Instead of leaning toward those bright, intense colors that I prefer in the spring, in summer I want something that has a much more cooling effect on me psychologically. I'm going for those pastel colors, soft lavenders, pinks, and buttery yellows. Now when it comes to producing lots of vibrant color in your garden, there's no better way to do it than with daylilies. They're tough, easy to grow, they're perennial, so they come back year after year, and they're beautiful. And you'll find virtually every color in the rainbow among them, except for blue. As a designer and artist, I'm naturally drawn to color, whether it's creating combinations in flower beds or in containers, or actually coming up with some of my own colors in terms of flower color. Just look at some of these daylilies I've hybridized. These are my little babies. I created them by crossing two of my favorite daylilies and have come up with some beautiful buttery yellows. You know, daylilies are one of the easiest flowers to grow. All you need is full sun, well-drained soils, and a hearty appetite for color because they'll deliver. Certainly for me, one of the most exciting aspects of the garden home is when it all begins to come together and those garden rooms really begin to feel just like that, an extension of your home. Now, I love to decorate with containers of beautiful flowers. Of course, successful containers are really all about the flowers you use, but it's also the care. First, let's talk about containers. There's a wide range to choose from, everything from plastic to styrofoam to ceramic, metal, and of course, that old standby terracotta. I'm kind of partial to terracotta myself. It's been a mainstay in gardens for thousands of years. It's interesting to me that the word terra means earth and cotta means baked or cooked. Some of the best terracotta comes from Italy. Often it's denser, less porous, and lasts longer. Now when you buy a container, make sure there's a hole in the bottom for drainage and don't forget the saucer. You'll see why this is important in just a few minutes. Now when it comes to soil, don't settle for digging up some of that stuff out of your yard. It just doesn't work. You want a soil that's loose and drains well. So go ahead and purchase a pre-mixed bag of potting soil. You'll be a step ahead. Oh, when it comes to fertilizer, I tend to feed my containers regularly, about every three weeks, with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer. Now, certainly watering is an important component to keeping containers beautiful and healthy throughout the growing season. It's really all about consistency. Most plants require consistent moisture. There are a couple of ways you can ensure that. One is, like I mentioned earlier, make sure you have saucers around the base of the plant so that they can always draw moisture up from that reservoir. And the other is to use a water retentive polymer that's actually mixed into the soil. Now here's what happens when you add these water retentive polymers to your soil. You see, these little granules look like ice cream salt. When water's applied, like this, the polymers expand, absorbing the water. In your container, this helps because as the soil dries, your plant can pull water from the polymers and stay hydrated longer. Now look, just after a few seconds, you can see that this polymer has already expanded from its dry state to several times its size. And just by putting a couple of tablespoons of it in this bowl, about a cup of water, you can see what happens. Just a little of this goes a long way, as you can imagine. About two to three tablespoons is all I use in a, like a 24 inch container. As we've seen in today's show, color is an important principle of design. It can influence our sense of depth perception, making some areas feel larger and more expansive and other areas smaller, depending on the color you use. Warm colors can excite us, while cool colors can make us feel calm. Color's a wonderful way to bring personality into our gardens. It offers us an opportunity for self-expression. Now, when you think about adding color to your garden, think about painting your garden, not with paint, but with beautiful flowers like these. And be generous, paint with a wide brush. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.
More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Oh my goodness, my garden's been flamingoed. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, the garden's about a lot of things, including having fun. Join us as we explore ways to add a touch of whimsy to the garden home. We'll look at, of all things, gnomes, chickens, hummingbirds, gourds, pink flamingos, and much more.